Come on, give me the intro, man. Stop. Forget about your intro. Just fuck the intros. Yeah. Fuck everything. Surviving the digital jungle is tough. We're here to guide you through it on the Digital Jungle Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Ames Digital Jungle Podcast. It is Reese, And again, I have another phenomenal guest joining me today. Uh, former Test Australian Cricket Wikikeeper, uh, radio personality, all-round good guy, podcast legend, uh, Brad Haddon. Welcome, mate. Welcome to the show. Hey, well, that's, uh, I'll take that introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reese. I'm a professional, mate, for sure. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much for coming in, mate. Um, very, 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 very fun to have you in here. Very exciting. Um, you have brought in some exciting things for us. I'm allowed to touch them. Yeah, go for your life. Wow, mate. Your baggy green. Yeah, that's wow. uh, test cap number 400. I, I was lucky to be the 400th wow. test player to, to play for Australia. And, and as we know, over the last month, we've been watching Ashes cricket. We've been watching the drama. We've, we've, we've been drama. watching the, uh, the theatre of it. We've watched the sledging. We've watched the rain. We've watched the ball tampering. Ooh. Mate, we've seen it all the uh, the last month. So that's the reason they all play. And, and the other one? Yeah, that was my, one of them probably just on par with my baggy green. That's the New South Wales cap. That was yeah. the, the first... Um, representative cap that's that's all I wanted to do I, I yeah, always, right. always wanted to have the opportunity to to play one game for, for New South Wales growing up in the country um, you, you've seen the War Brothers Mark Taylor Michael Slater lucky enough to play for that proud state and, and yeah. as a young kid that, that was your dream to yeah. and the opportunity to play one game at the SCG and I was lucky enough to to play over 100 call that my home for 15 years yeah. so uh, it was all for those two bits of cotton wow well, so what, uh, 66 tests, is that correct? Yeah, 66 tests. Wow, yeah. man. I, I didn't think I was going to actually get the opportunity to play test cricket, if, if I'm perfectly honest. So I didn't debut to, to late um, yeah. in, in in early 30s because I had the great Adam Gilchrist in, in front of us. So yeah. I remember debuting one day cricket, probably, I think I was 21, then then have a nine-year gap wow. um, before I got the opportunity to play test cricket. So I debuted in... Kingston, Jamaica. Yeah. Uh, my family sitting sitting in the grandstand. I reckon wow. my brothers were stoned after <laughs> enjoying uh, the, the good life in... Mate, uh, when in Rome? Oh, when in Jamaica? Mate, why not? So that, they were the most relaxed cricketers I've ever seen <laughs> um, watching. So yeah, it's been a good ride. Mate, well look, you know, as you mentioned with, with Gilly, look, you, big shoes to fill, but mate, you filled them. You did extremely, extremely well. And I think you've had an incredible career. There's there's no no doubts about that. And I've heard, obviously, passing that baton on to the new generation, I know that you're heavily involved in that and, and, and the new sort of generation of people coming through. And I think, look, your story, as you said, you know, New South Wales was the, that main sort of passion and drive. There's a lot of young people out there that would, would share that testament. You know, sometimes it's all about... I suppose those little victories in life, it's yeah. not necessarily about becoming a test cricketer, it's about the smaller gains. And and look, even from someone like yourself that's that's had such huge success, hearing your goal that was a little lower, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. That's a really, really interesting fact. I love that. Yeah, it is. I, I, as I said, I grew up in the country and the, and the one mm. thing you, you wanted to do, you, you actually wanted the opportunity to play a game at the SCG. Yeah. Uh, that, that was one of the big driving forces behind and I was lucky enough um, cricket took me there then yeah. once you get a little bit of a taste of, of playing for New South Wales mm. and we will all do the same in Boxing Day we, we watch the first test yeah. we go out and ha have a game in the backyard with a the, with the wet ball we take classic catches in the pool we come <laughs> and have some leftovers from, from Christmas lunch so yeah. then, then your dreams start to expand yeah. uh, you, you take it more serious and think oh hang on a minute I might get the opportunity to to wow. represent Australia, and I was very privileged. I had a great career. Mm. Um, I wouldn't change yeah, right. um, anything because I, I think that there's things that you say, I would have done different, but it sort of moulds you to, to where you are now. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you can't, well, you can't look back at anything nah. and sort of see it would be any different because where would you be, you wouldn't know. Yeah, it, um, exactly right. You mentioned Ashes. Obviously, we've just finished a, a great series. Yeah. It's uh, split, so we've managed to retain it, which is great. Um, but yeah, not shy of any controversy. Um, Look, Ricky Ponting has been very outspoken about the ball. And I think, look, you have to you look at the footage. I mean, it's just chalk yeah. and cheese, as I was saying. And it's just been really, really ridiculous. Where, where do you... Did, did, I mean, obviously, as Ricky said, that's a, that could have been a defining point in the series. And it definitely saw some change in the wicket. We saw a change in, in what was happening in the performance. Yes, OK, granted, it probably happened towards the tail end. But I mean, what, what's the ramifications for that as a player's perspective, right? When you're on field and you see something like this happen, 
you, there's nothing you can do at this point. How, how do you stay focused and stay still trying to fight and battle when things are working against you like that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it was definitely a defining moment in that test match. Yeah. Um, changing the ball's not new. Mm. That, that, that's, that, that's something that happens forever and a day. Yeah. You, you see England do it a lot. You've seen Australia do it a lot in the past. And, yeah. and, and the rule of thumb is the ball's out of shape. You go to the umpire, they have a box, yeah. and you get ball, a ball as close as to the other one as possible. I, <laughs> I, I think we've all seen the footage of, of yeah. this one. And I, I don't blame the players. I, no. I don't blame England. I'd no. like to. Don't, don't get me wrong. That would be the first thing I'd like to do. <laughs> or, or Australia. What, what I blame is... The investigation needs to look at is why the umpires didn't have a ball yeah. um, ready, like one ten overs, oh, one between 10 and 20, 20 and 30s, and so on, because it's, it's not uncommon place for these balls to go out of shape. Yeah. So I, I think the investigation needs to, to look at why weren't they prepared. Mm. This is not a, a, a series played um, at the back of Sri Lanka or no. Bangladesh. This is an Ashes. This is the marquee event. Absolutely. The theatre's different. The, the pressure's different. And, and I think that's where we need to... And then look at it. And yeah. on the flip side, Australians will be disappointed that they didn't adapt better. The ball did pl play a big role, yeah. but I think the investigation needs to be with the umpires how we actually got to that decision because yeah. we all know it stunk, the decision. Mate, you've got one old board and you've got one with right in on it. Mate. You do the mass. Well, and even, as you said, some of the balls that were in the box, I mean, they, they, there were some ones that were warned, but there was nothing even close to that one. And, and how as you said, how, does that, how do you even get to that point? So then that, that's the real problem because where do you lay blame? You, you can't necessarily say it was the, the international umpires that were sitting there making the decisions. You know, it was, it was the balls themselves, right? And then that very much changed the tone of the game. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the laying blame is an interesting one because mm. uh, I'm not in such a big event why wouldn't they have um, more balls available? I, I, I don't understand yeah. um, that one. If, if the ball is, you have different from one to 90 overs. I, I'd imagine you, you'd have, I don't know, 25 balls as close as you can get Absolutely. to the mark. Australia earned the right to, to be in front of that game. The, yep. the opening's done the hard work. They, yeah. they'd, they'd got the ball soft. They, they'd broken the back of the, the English and not all of a sudden the game changed. So as I said, I, I'd love to blame the English, but... <laughs> This was just part of the game. And yeah. yeah, I think um, the umpire's got this one wrong. Absolutely. And I think, I, look, I think there is, there has to be more of an investigation to it. I think there needs to be a bit more of a discussion about it. I mean, obviously, the good thing is, yes, okay, we've retained the Ashes. Yeah. That's obviously a big, that's a big stick to the English and we're happy for yeah. that all day, every day. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about, I, I suppose, the controversy that we saw in the, the famous stumping, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, as the previous wiki keeper, and, and I think, look, the, the biggest thing that I'll say is that we are armchair sportsmen, you know, me on this side of the fence. It's very easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, oh, exactly. I would have done. Oh, yeah, well, it's the best. It's a very, no lame blame, so it's yeah. good. And we can sit there and go, I would do things better. The, the whole point for a professional athlete, from my perspective, right, is that you guys are paid and you guys are employed and you guys are trusted to be in a position to make split second decisions, regardless of the consequences. You've got a job to do and you do your job all day, every day, right? So I think that's the whole point. Everyone else, essentially me, I would have sat there and gone, should I do this, should I not? Yeah. You don't have that time, you don't have that luxury. You as a professional player on that platform, you've been there before, would you have done anything different? Do you think you would have played it any differently? No, I, I don't. Mm. Um, and, and if you look up the lead up to that actually um, stumping, you, mm. you can see a couple of times, I think it was Matty Renshaw who come on as a subfielder, run to the stumps to gesture to Alex yeah. Carey to where well, he's wandering out of his crease. And, and, and as a batter, you, that, that's the, the trigger then to say, hang on a minute, um, I've got to be on my game. And, and we're always taught to look back to the wicket keeper, tap down, acknowledge. Yeah. Um, so from the Australian's point of view, it was a, it was a planned tactic. Um, and, and it was a concentration lapse there for yeah. from Johnny Besto. Um, a lot's been said about the, the spirit yeah. of cricket and, and the way it was handled. But Australia witnessed an opportunity. that They've seen an opportunity. They've seen a little chinky in the arm of Johnny Besto with, yeah. with some habits that he created. And, yeah. and, and winning test matches... It's all about recognising and then winning those big moments. And, Absolutely right. And, and that's exactly what they did. Australia seized on that. Yes, there was um, a lot of talk about it, but in saying that, how good was it? Well, it was the best, oh, right? Mate, I, I mean, it, it's one of those things. It's yeah. a defining moment. And, and what I was saying to a few of our sort of fellow fans here in the office was that it easily could have been reversed. That could have easily been an English thing and it was the Australians that came on the worst side of it. it I don't even think it's... It, 
And then, of course, it's an easy sledge to have with the English yeah. to say, oh, that's just the Australians for you. That's what they do. And then obviously the, there was comments about underarm bowling and the whole sort of thing that started going yeah. into it. And I, that's, the, that's the banter in the game, right? It's the spirit of yeah, the game. Well, well it's, it's interesting you say that about the spirit of the game. Mm. like that. And, and Ben Stokes is really strong on, no, I wouldn't yeah. do it that way. But yeah. come the last test match, Steve Smith gloved a ball from Moen Alley to um, a stretched up, Ben Stokes took an amazing catch. Yeah. Um, and as he brought it down, he dropped the ball. So right at that moment, you mm. had a spirit of cricket moment. Absolutely right. So Ben could have said, no, I haven't taken that catch. Move on. But it was a big moment. It was yeah. Steve Smith. Yep. The test match was on the line. And you could hear over the stump mics, yeah. the English players, they just throw it upstairs, make the umpire make the decisions, throw it upstairs. But to me, there was a moment there. If they want to talk about spirit of cricket and the way they played, Ben Stokes knew he didn't take that catch. Yeah. Absolutely. So right. he could have put an end to that. So I, I don't sign off to the the fact that yeah. uh, the oh yes we would have done things different. No 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 you didn't. Absolutely right. Under pressure you didn't do anything. And then that's what we come back to right. It's that split yeah. second decision that you put into that position under that pressure that you have to make that that sort of call. And and some go your way, some don't. And it, it yeah look I agree with you. I don't think it's got anything to do with the spirit of the game. I think the the best part about it is it made for a very interesting ashes and I think that's what we want you know we don't we don't want an easy win we don't want either Australians just to have a flog session you know we don't want the England to you want it to be a game that you're going to enjoy and watch and that's what gets more people interested in it because we've seen the media coverage from everything that's been happening from from the ashes perspective and it's get, it gets new people into the sport right and that's the hardest part you've got so many different competitions out there so many different sports that are taking that limelight if you can get in front of the headlines for a little bit, you might as well take it, right? Yeah. Well, and look, it helps your show as well, right? It helps everyone. <laughs> well, the, the one thing I, about an Ashes campaign, the theatre's different. Yeah. The, the theatre and pressure are, are different. I, I remember my first um, encounter with Ashes cricket, I, I was the reserve wicket keeper in 2005-06. And, yeah. and that goes down as probably one of the most entertaining series ever yeah. um, till, till this one um, of present day. Yeah, right. But I, I remember arriving in the UK and, and the whole theatre of... Um, the campaign's different. Yeah. You, you go to the airport, there's normally a couple of journos, all of a sudden there's a stack of 50. Wow. You go to the hotel, and, and everything about the game's different. I remember having a beer with Matthew Hayden, mm. and he said, you'll do some wonderful things for Australia. We're in a privileged position to, to play yeah. what we do. Yeah. Every test match is the same, and he said, but I'm telling you, you have to win an Ashes series before you retire. That, that's where your legacy will be. Yeah, right. Um, and, and that's the one thing that's stuck in my mind my whole time. Yeah, is right. Ashes cricket's different. Um, even when, if you're in England, mm. uh, if you're in the West Indies, they, they all talk about an Ashes campaign. It's a, yeah. the pinnacle of our career. Uh, even your mum and dad. Your dad goes to work. Yeah. Um, your your mum goes to the gym, they're asking her about, um, oh, what, what about the ashes? What about the... Yeah. E everything changes for everything. your family. So, I love yeah. that. Oh, so do I. That's great. I, I would have loved to be in this series, and I don't miss playing. I, yeah. I, I've had a great career, and I don't miss it one bit. Yeah, right. I would have loved to be Alex Carey, <laughs> the villain for the last three test matches. <laughs> I, I reckon that would have been a great place to be. <laughs> You'd love it, wouldn't you? Oh, we the best. <laughs> All right, well, look, we, we had one of your mates in last week on the show, which was really yep. cool. Ben Galea came in. We had a bit of a chat. We're, we're doing some work with him in his business. He's doing amazing things. Him and I were having a bit of a talk about the transition from professional sport into a professional career, yep. right? Now, you've been very fortunate enough to be utilizing your skills and go into media, which, you know, not a lot of sports people have that option and, and platform to do so. Where, where Did you always know you wanted to get into media or, or is that something that, that you planned or it just happened? No, it just happened that way. My, mine's an actually interesting story because I, I basically retired twice. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember in, um, my daughter got sick in 2012 yep. um, and, and I had to take 12 to 18 months out of the game. Yeah. Then I, I didn't think I'd come back and play. Yeah. Um, so we, we had to reassess things as a family mm -hmm. um, and now we do a lot of work we've got business outside we build a lot of storage units yeah um and different things like that so you've got a, an income that, that yeah. doesn't rely on cricket because we, i thought my career was over then yeah right um then it came to um, a time when mia started to, to to get on the improved family life got a bit more normal yeah uh, and, and then i could make a comeback um to, to the game and, and i didn't think i was going to be in that situation so mm. i, I probably had all the anxiety about retiring and, and all yeah. that then and, and yeah. set up myself then. So my last few years when I came back, I, I knew what I was going to do when, when I finished. Um, we had business outside. I, I was lucky enough now to, to work with Fox and Triple M and, and yeah. they're really privileged positions. Absolutely. Um, yeah, like I don't, I don't miss the game. Like no. I, I'm not someone that goes, oh, 
if you want to go to the nets and have a hit, I think, oh, I'll watch the bowlers now. And I think, oh, I'm not standing in front of no, them. I'm not going to be on the receiving yeah, side of that one. No that. way. But, uh, oh, I still enjoy talking about the game. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the, the transition out of the, the game can, can be very, very scary and, and oh. can be the unknown a, a lot for athletes. Absolutely. And I think that's why Ben's story I find so interesting, right? Because... I mean, obviously, as you, you're mates, right? So you've seen yeah. a lot of it sort of transition and grow. And I think his story is really interesting because I don't think as, again, an armchair sort of sportsman, I, I don't see that that correlation between what he transitioned to. So he's obviously got a finance business, forever funding, free plug. Um, but, you know, like it, that's not a natural progression. Obviously, coming back to his previous sort of history and things that he'd done before football and during football and stuff like that obviously makes things easier. But it's got to be a looming thing that's sort of over the head of any any sportsman of that and as you said your anxiety was sort of mitigated a little bit in the time yeah. and that was not so bad but it gets to that point when you're a certain age you know you still got responsibilities you've got family you've got a lifestyle that's been built around the success of your career and then you have to start all over again and, and build things from from scratch i mean it's a difficult place right it's got to be hard yeah i think someone um who's set up a successful business like ben has i think yeah. the one thing that um, they've done really well is take the habits from sport mm. and, and, and into business and, and we, yeah. we speak a lot about it you go to a lot of conferences now and and the the big thing that comes out of all that is people yeah. like we, we can sit in all the conferences we can go through everything but the the one thing i've found with with ben's business is the people it's a, it's a personal business because yeah. as soon as you mention finance to me i've got to cloud up Straight away. Yeah. yeah. And everyone does. I'm Absolutely. I'm going to buy a car. I've got to get finances. Oh, Shit. No, exactly. What, what, what am I going to do? Exactly. And, and having the, the relationship with, with Ben and forever funding for some time, the, the one thing when it first started, no matter if you're buying your first car or mm. your first um, home, you've got anxiety. Oh, absolutely. Because they're throwing numbers in front of you and you're going, oh, I've got to give you this. I don't yeah. understand that. But it's a trust. It, it's yeah. a trust. It, it's a personal touch. And... and it's those habits you create from being in a team mm. um, with, with sport that you can take over to, into business. And, and I think that's the one thing, ever funding's a family business. Yeah. Um, it's the one thing that they've taken over. And, and to take that anxiety out of that decision, yeah. because no matter what age it is, as soon as you say finance, uh, we all go, what's going to happen here? No, and so, there's so many questions, there's so yeah. many things. And then the whole thing is like, especially it's, it's a lot of industries, but finance I think worse, is that there's a million different stories and narratives that are thrown at you and you think, well, that guy sounds dodgy, but he's actually not, or this guy doesn't. And it, you know, there's so many different stories. And you're right. I mean, the familiar face of having a, a, an ex or a former football player that you recognize and you know, but five seconds into having a chat with him, you just go, man, this guy's just, he's just, he's just a straight shooter, right? He's yeah. just a genuine guy. His advice is going to be sound and I, and I know I can trust him. Yeah, I, I don't think it's been an ex-football player. I, mm. I think it's the, the habits that it, it creates. Like yeah. straight away, you, you feel comfortable in the environment. Yeah. Because as we said before, finance can create anxiety and yeah. it's talking you through the process um, yes, they've got to do a lot of work behind the scenes, but it's a follow-up. It's yeah. a follow-up. How, how's everything going? Yeah. Um, is everything under control? You understand what we've gone through. Yeah. Um, and, and then it's a follow-up in six months and 12 months' time. So when you go again, mm. you lose a little bit of that anxiety because yeah. you've built the relationship. And, and the one thing with me, it, it, it's about people. It, yeah. It's about you, you get to feel straight away. Mm. You go, no. Oh, Especially in finance. Yeah, yeah finance. But with, with yeah. Ben, it's, it's about the person first. Yeah. Yes, you know you're doing the, the best thing you can for the business. Yeah. But also, for you and your family, you don't have those... And we all go home with the conversation. Why have we done this right? Have we done that oh. right? And you go, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know whether I've done it right. It's and especially the room for error is so small, right? Because you're not talking about, you know, maybe you bought the wrong yogurt from the from the grocery store and the missus is going to give you a hard time. You're talking about finance. You're talking about something that can really affect the future and the, and the safety and the security of your family. And I think you're, you're exactly right. Forever Funny are doing a great job. Ben's uh, The fact that Ben is, is still so hands-on, yeah. I think is so refreshing from a, from a just a business perspective and even even from his i suppose his future and where he wants to go the fact that he is so hands-on i mean it, it, it leads to success you know the more the more involved the more intimate you are with your business the better it goes you know yeah, i think the one thing that they do better than most mm. is they make you feel like the most important person in the room yeah. and, and you mightn't be you, you might be um getting a five thousand dollar car yeah or you might be getting a three million dollar mortgage yeah but you, you still feel like on you're on the same level and that's yeah. the one thing um, well, I'm, I'm proud to, to be involved in Ever Funny because of that. You, yeah. you walk in the room, everyone feels like the most important person yeah. in the room. 
Oh, man. That's a wrap for you, man. That's really good. <laughs> ah, yo, <yeah, it> <laughs> Absolutely. Look, man, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us, man. I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule. Um, thank you so much. I'd love to have you back on, on board sometime for another chat, and we'll hear about what's going on next. Again, Brad Haddon, thank you so much for your time, man. Really Thanks appreciate it, mate. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Awesome. Come on, give me the intro, man. Start. Forget about your intro. Just fuck the intros. Fuck yeah. everything. Surviving the digital jungle is tough. We're here to guide you through it on the Digital Jungle Podcast.